A copywriter knows that to get an audience to take a desired course of action, they have to get inside their heads and understand what makes them tick. Psychology is therefore a big part of the copywriting process. Understanding how your audience feels, what they're looking for in life, and what problems they're looking for solutions to is the real key to effective copywriting. It sounds rather daunting, but it is something that can be fairly easily achieved. Put yourself in the shoes of your audience. Why would they want the product that you're selling? What will they get out of it? What problem could they have that would be solved by it? Okay, that may seem too much like guesswork for many, so how about doing a bit of research? I'm sure you know people from all walks of life, many of whom could be prospective buyers. Talk to them. Ask, ask them their opinion on a product. Tell them about it and see how they react. Why not ask them something like, what would make them buy it? Why would they buy it? And what would they hope to achieve from buying it? Again, this is a subject that would form a course all on its own. And we'll be delving into the subject in far greater depth than in the 200 and 300 levels of this course. For now, with this in mind, this session will develop your conceptual and theoretical understanding of behavioral aspects of consumers and their strategic implications to marketers. Okay, so let's get started. Upon completion of this session, you'll be able to identify the major individual social and cultural factors that affect consumers' decision-making processes. You'll be able to explain and analyze the major stages which consumers usually go through when making a consumption-related decision. Understand the essence of how consumers make decisions and assess the relevant implications for marketing practitioners. This session builds on the knowledge you've already developed in SMU 101, an intro to the to branding unit. This session will also help develop your critical thinking, appreciation of cross-cultural differences, and oral and written communication skills. When you write for an audience, part of understanding that audience is understanding its psychology. Psychological triggers are probably going to be the most interesting of the points you want to consider when writing copy or any kind of branding message. The previous session covered points to consider when writing the actual copy itself. But now we need to get ready for the psychology that should be considered when writing your messages. Concepts that took me years of failure, experience, and gradual insight to understand and implement. You may understand and relate to some of these concepts straight away. Some of you may not fully understand without actually experiencing them yourself. And finally, some of you will require a fairly detailed explanation. So okay, let's get started. Remember that story of me in the Donna Karen shop? That store manager knew she had a 50% chance of selling me that suit. Even better, she knew that if I didn't buy that suit, which I didn't in the end, that I would buy another suit in that store, which I did. Two of them, if you remember. She read me, and she knew that I was in the right buying environment. Direct response advertising, it just doesn't give us the opportunities of observing our prospects. We're not there to see people checking out our wares, but you can get them to tune in to whatever it is you're selling by giving them a feeling of involvement with, or ownership of, the product or service you're selling. In all of my ads, I try to make the prospects imagine they're actually using my product, whether it's music or a university course. Think about those Satyagraha ads where I show two strong listening contexts for two specific audience tribes. I created, through imagination, the reader's experience of ownership and involvement. In short, I take the mind on a mental journey to capture the involvement of the reader. I make the reader believe that he or she could indeed be listening to the music, or sitting in a university lecture hall, or canteen, or using the university's creative spaces, and experiencing the very same things that I've just described in my copy. It's mental energy creating a picture for the prospect, whose mind is kind of like a vacuum waiting to be filled. I did the same thing when I was adverti in advertising when it came to cat food and airlines. In fashion PR, I did it 
about wearing creations from that season's collection for the designer accounts that I worked on. Or think about that fictitious Harley Davidson ad that I outlined. There were two levels of involvement there. Understanding the man actually riding the Harley, and the investment banker type looking at the man riding the Harley. In your copywriting, let your readers take a stroll down a path with you, or let them smell the fragrance through your nose, or let them experience some of the emotions you're feeling by forming a mental picture from your description. If I were writing it an advertisement for the Corvette sports car, my first draft, the stuff that comes straight out of my head, would say probably something like, take a ride in the new Corvette. Feel the breeze blowing through your hair as you drive through the warm evening. Watch heads turn. Punch that accelerator to the floor and feel the burst of power that pins you into the back of your contour seat. Look at the beautiful display of electronic technology right on the dashboard. Feel the power and excitement of America's super sports car. And then, of course, I'd go about getting rid of a lot of those cliches. But you get the idea about feeling, seeing, and experiencing what it would be like to drive a Corvette. I'd explain all of the special features of the car, the logic upon which to justify its purchase, but I would really play up the feeling of involvement and ownership. This technique is used in many different ways. In direct marketing, it's often referenced, referred to as an involvement device, something that involves the consumer in the buying process. Sometimes it may seem silly. However, make your reader become involved in a solicitation. Similarly, your reader is either taking action or imagining taking action through the power of the words that you write. TV and the internet are great examples of involvement. You see, hear, and can almost touch the product. It's no wonder why that TV and the internet are amongst the most effective ways to sell. The feeling of ownership is a concept that's pretty close to the feeling of involvement. But here, you're making readers feel that they already own the product, and that you're kind of letting them use their imaginations as you take them through the steps of what it would be like if they actually did own it. An example might be, when you receive your exercise device, work out on it. Adjust the weights. See how easy it is to store under your bed. In short, you're making them feel that they already bought the product. If you were selling a designer's 600 pound little black cocktail dress, how would you sell it? Where would the emphasis be? On its hand-stitched design and quality? As the answer to the, what will I wear to this year's corporate office summer party type question? If you're an NGO aiding people in developing nations through something like water purification, what do you stress more? guilt about how good many others have it around the planet, or through a positive message about the benefits of good global citizenship. Or think about a high-end kitchen design. Is it really about all the bells and whistles, or about providing a space for families to create great new memories? Brand and copy that involves the reader can be quite effective, especially if the involvement device is part of the copy. Whenever you write copy, keep this very important concept in mind. It can make the messages far more effective. If I had to pick the single most important point of this session, I would pick honesty. Your copy must be honest. This doesn't mean that if you're dishonest in your message, you won't actually achieve a successful result. Give the consumer a price that's too hard to believe, or a product that doesn't live up to its claims, and you might be able to get away with it once, maybe even twice, but definitely not for the long haul. But this bit on honesty, it's not about whether you can get away with being dishonest, or even for how long. It's about honesty as a psychological selling tool. First, let's start out with a very important premise. Consumers are very smart. Far smarter than you think, and smarter collectively than any single one of us. With all the experience I have in marketing products, and with all the product knowledge I've gained over the years, you can take my word for it. The consumer is quite sharp. The consumer can also tell whether people are truthful and what they're trying to communicate. And the more truthful you are in your brand messages, 
the more effectively your messages will be accepted by your prospects. Try to lie in your, in your copy, and you're only deceiving yourself. Your copy will say what you think you wanted it to say, but it will also say what you thought you'd actually covered up. Even a reader who kind of hurries over your copy, they can actually feel the difference. When I write copy, I include many of the negative features. Remember the, sl the slippery slide in answering questions? In marketing a brand new and untried creative MBA course, I put the fact right out in front. It was new and untried. I couldn't hide that fact, so why would I try to? It might have been new, but look at the lecturers who are part of its staff and check out their credentials. That was the selling point. In other words, I would explain why the flaws really didn't amount to much and why the consumer should still buy the product. People tend to respond well to this approach, and at least in my experience, they actually do respond. It creates trust, an essential psychological component between brands and audiences. It seems that the more truthful and frank my copy was, the more my, audi my audience responded and responded in a positive manner. One time, a recording artist and I, we really didn't agree on the quality of some of the tracks on his forthcoming album. It happens more often than you really think between labels and the artists. The album's 16 tracks, of which 8 were truly excellent, 2 were good, and the remaining 6 were, well, either uninspiring, mediocre, or just plain bad. In truth, it wasn't value for money, at least in my opinion. My advice was to cut the album down to only 10 songs. Neither he or his manager would budge. It was 16 tracks in the album or nothing. So I broke precedence and released the album digitally first through various download services and held the physical album back for about two months after the digital release date. While I didn't say that the reason was due to there being a number of subpar tracks, anyone familiar with the genre could easily read between the lines of the copy and get that there was an issue with a handful of the tracks. This seems counterintuitive, especially for a record label, but through this, I was able to steer the artist's audience towards the tracks that were excellent, the sales of which were very, very buoyant. It was a bold mood by a record label, one that I've never seen replicated anywhere else. However, it earned Aardvark big trust points, which translated into sales. And it also proved my point. We kind of packaged the, after a few months, we packaged the kind of online release as a special release with additional tracks. But when it came to release the physical CD, lo and behold, the CD itself was only 10 tracks and not 16. Now I could have lied, but this artist, artist audience would have sniffed that out in a second. They'll pick out a phony statement every single time. I learned to make every communication to my customers truthful, no matter the format. And the more truthful I am, the more responsive my customers tend to be.
Not too far from honesty is integrity. A brand's message is a personal message from an organization or an individual and is a direct reflection of the writer's personality and integrity. You can convey this integrity by the truthfulness of your message, the look of your message, the image that you convey, and even the typefaces that you use. Integrity can be reflected by the choices you make in your use of print or online layout. Is it clean and neat? Or is it shouting at you with color bars running in different directions and headlines screaming and words underlined and pictures exaggerated? You kind of get the idea. The integrity of the person delivering the message is always amazingly clear to the recipient. And this integrity is often reflected by the, the appearance of the advertisement in the copy that you write. Show good integrity and your advertising message will be well received. Don't show it and join the ranks of those who are rarely successful. If you convey honesty and integrity in your message, chances are you've gone a long way towards establishing your credibility. However, credibility is not just honesty and integrity. Credibility is about being believable. So some examples. In an ad for a product whose price is exceptionally low, you've got to convey that the offer you're making, as great as it may seem, is indeed a valid, legitimate offer. Let's say you're offering something for £10 that everyone else is selling for £40. Your job is establishing credibility for your price. You might explain that you're buying it at a very large volume from the Far East and that you're able to buy the remaining stock from a major manufacturer for a very low price. In short, you've got to establish the credibility of your company and your offer. Credibility also means truthfulness. Does the consumer really believe you? Rash statements, cliches, and some exaggerations will remove any credibility your offer may have had. One of the most important factors that could affect credibility is not resolving all of the objections that you're raising in your readers' minds, such as hiding something or avoiding an obvious fault of the product or the service. Remember the MBA example that I gave previously. I could have tried to hide the fact that it was new and untried and untested, but I put that right out in front because that would be a major question that any prospective student would have had. You need to raise all objections and then resolve them. Products that require installation or assembly are perfect examples. If it's obvious that a product doesn't just pop out of, out of a box ready to use, you must explain that it does require assembly. You might say something like, 
To make it easy, we provide you with all the tools and our tests. It only took five minutes for somebody with very little mechanical skill to put whatever the object is together. Once again, it is the anticipation of objections and the resolution that means so much to, to the credibility of an ad. You are, in essence, sensing the next question the consumer may ask and answering it in a straightforward, honest, incredible way. The integrity of your product, your offer, and yourself are all on the line, and unless you convey the highest credibility in your ad and your copy, your prospects will not feel comfortable buying from you. Once a brand's reputation is established, it becomes easier to sell a difficult product that would normally require a lot of credibility. And that's because the brand already has a lot of credibility with its customers. If a product is being offered by that brand, it must be good. That's the perception. That's the reality. However, that new product must have the quality that consumers have come to expect. And chances are, the product will, will be bought by somebody who has bought products from that brand before and already feels that the company is a very credible concern. The effect of credibility also extends to the magazines, newspapers, or websites in which you advertise. If you advertise your product in the Wall Street Journal, you're kind of piggybacking on to their credibility and their constant vigilance, making sure their readers aren't being taken advantage of. On the other hand, place that same ad in, say, The Sun, and you then begin to maybe perhaps take on the lack of credibility that this publication has established in the mind of certain readers. Again, credibility is affected by the environment in which you place your brand's messages. You can enhance credibility through the use of associated brand name products. For example, if I'm offering an electronic product by the name of Bravura, with the exact same features as one whose brand name is Sony, which one has more credibility? The Sony would probably sell better if both were at the same price. Adding an appropriate celeb celebrity endorser is perhaps another effective way of enhancing credibility. The name of another company can as well. Sometimes a city or state can add credibility, believe it or not. That's why some companies located in smaller cities have offices in London, Paris, or New York. The various ways of adding credibility should be an important consideration in crafting your advertising. In any brand message, the copywriter wants to convey, through examples or by comparison, that what the cons customer is actually buying is indeed good value. A typical example in copywriting is where the copywriter compares the prices of the brand he or she is marketing to products with similar features and point out that his or her brand is providing a better value. By positioning your product and comparing it with others, or even by providing the value of something, even though the value may not be apparent, you are providing the logic with which the prospect can justify the purchase. Simply educating the reader to the intrinsic value of your product is equivalent, equivalent to lowering its price. In short, there is a value associated with the education you are providing your reader. The buying transaction is an emotional experience that uses logic to justify the buying decision. You buy a Mercedes automobile emotionally, but you then justify its purchase logically with its technology, safety, and resale value. So justifying its value is something that the consumer wants to do before making an emotional pur purchase. And with such intense competition in the world, there is a question in the mind of the consumer. Am I buying the product at the best price? Once again, you must resolve that question or you're not communicating effectively with your prospect. Okay, so this is a great follow-on point. One of the questions people may think about while reading brand copy is this one. Can I really justify this purchase? Once again, it's a question that's raised and then must be resolved. If you don't resolve it, then you won't answer all of the prospect's questions. And this will give the prospect the opportunity or the excuse to ask, to, well, basically think this, I'll think about it. And of course, once they think about it, in the cold light of day, logic kicks in, and they will never buy. Somewhere in your copy, you should resolve 
any objection by providing some justification to the purchaser. Sometimes it's just saying something like, you deserve it. And other times, you might have to justify it in terms of savings. Things like, the price is a one-time only value. Or give health reasons. It protects your eyes, for example. Or use the recognition factor. Something like, the men in your life will love the way you look in it or dozens of other reasons based on the wants and needs of your prospect. The higher the price point, the more need there is to justify the purchase. That's so important, I'm gonna say it again. The higher the price point, the more need there is to justify the purchase. The lower the price point, or the more value the price represents, the less you have to justify the purchase. You may just need to reassure about the quality. In fact, the lower the price, the more greed actually plays a role. How many times have you heard someone say, I got a great deal for next to nothing? This is a primary human urge in need, and it's something that we'll be getting into a little bit more in depth later on in this session. Well, I can't resist a little bit more about greed now. Greed in the form of attraction to bargains is a very strong motivating factor. I don't know how many times I've bought things even though I didn't need them simply because they were a bargain. Don't hesitate to recognize greed as a very strong factor in either low-priced merchandise or expensive products offered at a low price. Too low a price may diminish your credibility unless you justify the low price. Many people are willing to risk dealing with an unknown vendor just to pay less and get more for their money. Providing the consumer with more than what's normally received for that price is a way of appealing to a customer's greed. This is especially true if you sell a product at a lower price for a limited time before offering the same product at a higher price. Greed is not a technique that can be employed all the time, but it should be recognized as an effective element that plays on everybody's weaknesses. When you lower the price of a product, you usually end up with more unit sales. Keep lowering the price and you'll continue to generate more unit sales than before if the price drop is big enough. But go too low and you'll have to add a little justification for the lower price as it will start raising credibility issues with your prospects. It'll also tend to upset those who bought your product at the higher price. That's always worth bearing in mind. Greed is really not a very positive human trait, but it exists and it is a force to consider when communicating with your prospects. There's always something that you can say about your company to establish your authority, size in the market, position in the market, or intention. The consumer loves to do business with experts in a particular area. That's why there's a growing trend away from department stores that sell general merchandise to category stores that sell a specific line of products. Category stores have more expertise, knowledge, and authority in a specific category. Establishing your authority is something that should be done in each brand's message regardless of how big or how little you are. For example, America's largest supplier of specialized products for the home development industry. Or even if you're the smallest, you can always say, Something like, the hardest working bunch of guys in the event production business. If you really examine your company, you will find something you can say that establishes your authority and expertise in what you're selling. Otherwise, why is your brand even in business? Then, after you establish your authority, there's going to be the temptation to stop using the phrase that established your authority in the first place. I know that at Aardvark, when we had run the phrase, the label that shares, for almost six years, I wonder if we really needed it. But there were always those first timers who just happened to catch whatever brand's message that had that line in it at the time. And they needed that reassurance that they were dealing with an authoritative company in the field in which they were competing, you know, contemplating a purchase. That phrase gave them the confidence to buy from us. Sometimes, it's easy to establish authority by virtue of the name of a company. 
Which sounds like it has more authority? Leighton Stone Video Store or Netflix? Penryn Computers or Computer Discount Warehouse? Companies like Netflix and Computer Discount Warehouse, they have name recognition. Plus these names, well, they tell you something about the company through the very name itself, which again plays into the importance of name recognition value. Sticking with the example of Leighton Stone Video Store in Netflix, if you were Leighton Stone Video Store, how would you convey the benefits and the experience of your service over, say, the perceived convenience of Netflix? It is possible, but it does require some thoughts, and maybe that's something that you want to tackle within the scenario, se scenario section of this session. People naturally respect a knowledgeable authority. Let's say you want to buy a computer. You might first check with the expert in your family or amongst your friends. You know, that one person who's known as the computer genius. Let's call, let's call him Danny. Danny's established his authority and you feel quite comfortable going to him to get advice. He'll then tell you what he thinks you should buy and from whom. And chances are he'll recommend some retail outlet that's established itself with some level of authority. I do it myself every time it comes time to upgrade my mobile phone. I have my go-to person within my family who knows all about mobile telephones and smartphones and all the rest of it. He'll ask me, you know, what I want to use it for, how I use my smartphone, and various, various other kind of consideration points for me to think about, and he always comes up with a bang-on recommendation. Each and every one of us has this kind of go-to person in our life regardless of what it is that we're looking for. So sticking with computers and Danny. Okay, it might be the cheapest computer company or maybe the, com the company that provides the best service. You'll seek out the type of authority that you need. Sometimes the authority doesn't even have to be stated. It can just be felt in the copy. The layout of that copy or, or advertisement or the message of a brand or the brand message. Establish your authority in the field of the product or service that you're selling, and you'll find that it'll make a big difference in your company's effectiveness, especially when it comes to delivering effective brand messaging. Think about a time when someone asked your advice before making a purchase, or vice versa, when you needed input. It could have been before buying a car, going on holiday, going to an expensive restaurant. We've all been there. So use this to put yourself in your reader's shoes. Nobody wants to make a mistake. You too, at some point, wanted reassurance and confidence about a purchase that you were going to make, that the money you were about to exchange was going to be spent wisely. The same holds true when you buy anything of value. You just want reassurance. If, however, you can trust the sales organizations to be the experts, then you won't really need any outside expert opinion. Although you might still go for an outside opinion for that ju logical justification. But at your impulse level, that expertise has kind of settled that question in your mind. Even after you buy something, you still often seek confirmation that your purchase was indeed a good one. The late direct marketing consultant, Paul Bringe, he once wrote, one of the first things we do after making a sizable purchase is to seek assurance from others that our decision was indeed a good one. We tell our family, our neighbors, our friends, and our business associates and wait for their approval. This is so true.
A satisfaction conviction basically conveys a message from you to your prospect that says something like, hey, I'm so convinced you'll like this product that I'm going to do something for your benefit to prove just how incredible my offer actually is. If your potential customer, after reading what you're going to do, says something like, they must really believe in that product, or how can they do it, or even, are they going to get ripped off by customers who will take advantage of this generosity, then you know you've got a great example of a satisfaction conviction. And this goes way beyond things like refunds. It usually involves perhaps a refund and something extra. For instance, if you're offering a membership or a subscription, you could offer a refund on the disused portion of the membership or subscription plus interest. Typically, the satisfaction conviction comes towards the end of the copy. If you've gotten the reader into the slippery slide and all the way down to the end of your copy, it's that last part of the message where you've got an awful lot to do. Think about it. You've got to explain the offer to the prospect why it's a good offer, and why he or she should buy the product or service. And then you've got to do something dramatic to push him or her over the edge, all within the very last part of your sales message. It's like a salesperson asking for the order and then also saying, and if you buy this from me now, I'll do something that few salespeople would do to ensure your satisfaction. The right satisfaction conviction is important too. The ideal satisfaction conviction should raise an objection and then resolve it, as I've indicated previously, but in resolving it, going beyond what people actually expect. First, the satisfaction conviction raises what's usually the last question a perspective has. And that question usually runs along the line of, what happens if I'm not satisfied, if I don't like the product or service? You get the idea. And then it resolves it with a satisfaction conviction, something that go goes beyond what people were actually expecting. And that's typically, we'll not only refund it, you can, but we'll give you interest, or return it to us with free postage, or we'll, you know, something like we'll refund the price plus give you an extra ten percent. But be careful to use a satisfaction conviction that makes sense for the offer. You wouldn't want to raise an objection and then satisfy it with the wrong resolution, because that's only going to raise more questions. Make sure any objection is indeed satisfied by the correct resolution. In short, it's got to make sense. The satisfaction conviction is a crucial part of the sales message, and few realize its actual importance. Yet, if you can create a powerful satisfaction conviction, this simple device will go a great deal for the success of your offers. Okay, this is one of the really important keys in determining how to sell a product. First, you have to realize that every product has its own unique personality, its own unique nature, and it's up to you to figure out what that is. After the first unit on branding, that shouldn't be too difficult, especially at this point in the course. How do you present the drama of that product? Every product has one very powerful way of presenting itself that will express the true advantages and emotion that the product has to offer and motivate the largest number of people to buy it. By realizing the nature of every product and playing into its strengths, you will end up with a very powerful and emotionally dramatic presentation. Think about other examples. What is the nature of a toy? It's a fun game, so you bring out the enjoyment. What's the nature of an IKEA shelving unit? It's a stylish product at a budget price that should be easy to build, look good, and provide a convenient way to display whatever it is you want to display. Very often, common sense is all you need to understand and appreciate the nature of a product. Realizing that, you must understand the nature of the product you're selling, or you won't effectively sell it. And by that I mean you will miss the true emotional trigger, which is a fundamental aspect of the whole consumer psychology process. In selling, 
It's important to understand not only the nature of the product that you're offering, but the nature of your prospect as well. Remember Zeton Spore, the side transact signed to Aardvark Records? One of the secrets of Zeton Spore's success is its rapport with its fans and with its audience at their concerts. They took this much further than many other acts, and it went well beyond merely just speaking to the crowds from the stage. No, they insisted on going out into the crowd after each and every single performance, and that meant hanging out, chatting, and sharing a laugh with them. And they'd get out on the dance floor themselves after their gig was over. They understood their audience. They understood the kind of connection, the kind of rapport their fans valued. And Zeton Spore delivered, every single time. In quick time, it became part of the reputation, and this formed an unbreakable bond between them and their fans. This translated into a buzz about the act, which led to bigger audience, audiences and increasing music sales. Zeton Spore understands the psychological trigger of their product, which is music, and of their prospects. In other words, alternative types looking for a deeper but fun social interaction based on peace, love, unity, and respect. The key in this case was the power of knowing the nature of the prospect, those emotional aspects of the prospect that would respond best to this approach. It's an approach that turned this act into rising stars within its own particular music genre, all from a simple approach that was so kind of easy to do. Let me cite a few more examples to illustrate this very important principle. If I was selling a home, I would get to know the motivations of my prospects and what they were looking for in a home, specifically my kind of home. I'd find out their history. I'd ask them about their other home buying experiences and what their hobbies were. I'd gather as much information about them as possible and then I would develop a sense of what emotional needs that particular part of the house buying market might have. Understanding their needs and the nature of the prospect in general would give me enough information to craft a very effective sales presentation that, ideally, would match the nature of my product with the nature of my prospect. The prospect has basic emotional needs that your product or service will solve, regardless of how sophisticated or simple your product offering is. Examine these emotional needs. It is from the perspective of emotion that you will reach the core essence of your prospect's motivation. And it's from this essence that you'll get all the clues you need to uncover the way to that prospect's heart and soul, and eventually to his or her wallet. In my own practice, I tend to avoid fads. However, there are classic examples when a brand has tapped into a fad with stunning success. Levi's, Tango, Smirnoff. These are just a few success stories about where brands meet fads. I only tend to avoid them because a fad can die just as quickly as it can grow. So for instance, zombies are the latest fad. Yesterday, it was vampires. There are even fads with design, from fonts, to colors, to layouts, to photography styles. If you do decide to tap into a fad when it comes to crafting your own branding messages, you must capture the moment early enough and get out right after that fab begins to peak. But be careful. I can tell you stories, or should I actually say nightmares, that show how dangerous fads can be with your financial health. Spirit Airlines tried to stay topical by referencing the Gulf oil spill in their travel ads. Um, the tagline read, read something like, check out the oil on our beaches. They quickly realized that making light of one of the worst environmental disasters of our time was not a wise choice. The resulting backlash caused the company to pull their ads, which cost a fortune to produce in the first place, although Sprint maintained people simply misunderstood their message. That was their take on it. In 2002, right before the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in May, Abercrombie and Fitch released a new line of t-shirts aimed at trendy young Asian Americans. But rather than do any real research into what kind of thing young Asian Americans would like to put on their bodies, a &F went right ahead and printed a bunch of rice patty hat-wearing, buck-tooth and slanty-eyed cartoon characters 
selling imaginary laundry services with, and I kid you not, slogans that said things like, two Wongs can make it white. Yeah, okay, they went there. They really did go there. And um, as you can imagine, Asian Americans, well, they were pretty universally pissed. Politicians notoriously try to tap into fads and zeitgeists at the moment, usually with horrific results. Don't take my word for it. Read, just Google political ad fails. Knowing how to recognize a fad and capitalizing on it can be a very powerful tool if your timing is right. And this brings us very nicely to the next topic. How many times have you been too early with an idea or too late? I've heard complaints from many of my students who've, who've failed because their timing just wasn't right. Timing certainly has a lot to do with fads. You want to be involved at the beginning of a fad and not enter in the middle or the end. That's what's considered smart timing. But there are products that have just been introduced too early or too late. And that relates to timing too. When do you introduce a new product? Is your market ready for it? And how do you know? The answer really is quite simple. No one knows. That's why it's always a good idea to test a product first. The consumer will tell you if you're too early or too late or right on target. Using an example, if house burglaries were on the increase, it's good common sense to offer burglar alarms and to actively promote them. Using another example, universities do this kind of testing all the time. They do extensive research, or they should be doing extensive research, and gauge the marketplace before offering any new course. Falmouth launched a creative MBA because there was a demand for an MBA tailored to the creative industries with a global and sustainable focus. Not only was the current demand high, the projected annual demand was forecast to rocket over the next two decades. So, what's the selling trend for your product or service?
A critical technique that I've used in my own branding messages is a process called linking. Basically, it's the technique of relating what the consumer already knows and understands with what you're selling to make the new product easy to understand and relate to. One of the easiest ways to explain this trigger is just to describe how it works in a fad, a craze that captures the public's consciousness and quickly creates a strong demand, awareness, or behavioral changes. So let's think about the popular craze for taking selfies. The Dove brand, for instance, tapped into the whole selfie thing to create some really quite memorable branding campaigns. The demand can be for a product such as for the Beanie Babies in the 1990s, or the Citizens Band CB radios back in the 70s. It can be simply the strong awareness of a new or different product or concept, or it can be for behavioral changes. There are also fads within specific industries. For example, in the exercise industry, there may be a fad for abdominal devices or a product to en enhance low impact aerobics, Pilates, whatever. Usually the fads come and go and they come and go quite quickly, but the importance of the fad example is to show you the process of linking on its most basic and obvious levels. Then I'll take you deeper to give you a sense of how linking, well, it can basically be used to effectively sell any product or service. For instance, it's no accident that trance and electro house music tracks have covers featuring, featuring scantily clad women or summer beach scenes or use lush colors. These all promote sexiness, allure, etc. It's no coincidence that dubstep, drum and bass, and techno music use dark and aggressive artwork, or that Slytrons has strong as associations with galactic or science fiction motifs. The next time you're in a bookstore, look at the book jackets. Romance novels have book jacket artwork, colors, and fonts that conform to its genre conventions. Romance novels look completely different from historical fiction, which looks completely different from autobiographies and biographies, which themselves look absolutely different to health and fitness books. Genre conventions, no matter the industry or subject, they are a kind of fad. Why do luxury brands from Chanel to Gucci to Jaguar to Vogue use thin lettering for fonts? and earth tones in their branding messages. It's an enduring convention that has come to be associated with refinement and elegance. But I digress. The minute there is a lot of publicity about something, and it has the potential to turn into a fad, you can have a real opportunity to link it into, onto something that you're doing, either to get publicity or to promote a product. Fads are very powerful, and you now understand the basic concept of linking. But how does this help you as a copywriter? Whenever I sell a new product or a new feature of a new concept, I use linking. I take what is familiar to the prospect, relate it to the object that I'm selling, and create a bridge in the mind of my prospect. Because of this linking, the prospect needs to think a lot less to understand the new product. The product is easier to relate to, to the needs of the prospect as well. And in this way, everyone wins. I could give you many examples, but the main point to remember about linking, though, is that it should relate the product or service you're selling to something that is easy for your prospect to identify with so that you bridge the mental gap in the mind of the prospect. I'll say that again. The main point to remember about linking is that it should relate the product or service that you're selling to something that is easy for your prospect to identify with. And we do this so that, the, so that you can bridge the mental gap in the mind of the prospect. Usually products are simply improved versions of previously sold products. You need to relate the older product to the new version to explain the difference. One of the hardest things to use linking for is a miracle product a product that is just simply too good to be believed. For example, Silverman gives a great example. He was tasked with selling a pill that you put into a gas tank of a car 
that would improve gas mileage and clean out the engine and had 10 times the fuel additives of super unleaded fuel. It was a product that was difficult to link to anything that existed in the marketplace. It was that revolutionary. So he used phrases like vitamins for your car and tune up in a pill as a few of his links. And that did the trick. Pe those instantly became relatable things that people understood and they actually got the concept of what this pill did. Excellent branding campaigns have also been crafted using historical movement moments. The 1969 moon landing, the Battle of Waterloo, and the flight of the Kitty Hawk have all been the subjects of brilliant brand campaigns. Linking is a basic human emotional system of storing experiences and knowledge, and then recalling those experiences and linking them to something we have to deal with on a daily basis or that is already in the public's consciousness. Believe it or not, whether consciously or subconsciously, we often link.